this edition of Fifth Gear, one of the best handling cars in the world, second hand. How to bag a bargain number plate. And the latest Radical Renault, the new Espace. In case you hadn't noticed, hot hatches are big business once again. No self-respecting car maker can do without one in their model lineup, and not a month seems to go by without yet another, even hotter one, sending motoring journalists into a frenzy. So we brought our favourite six-pack here to Anglesey to see what's currently hottest of the hot. MG Rover have maxed out the 25 to make it the ZR. BMW's Mini Cooper now comes with an S that makes it supercharged. And in response, Renault have shed the kilos and the price with this stripped-out Clio Cup. But it's this 197 horsepower Honda Civic Type R that holds the hot hatch crown. Now, though, two big heavyweights have arrived, offering over 200 horsepower. The Seat Leon Cupra R and the hot hatch everyone is talking about, the Ford Focus RS. So what's our verdict? Well, I am a big fan of everything MG are trying to do to put some life into old Rovers. But whilst this ZR has much improved looks and handling, it is the least powerful of our bunch. I'm sorry, but the interior is, well, awful. Good, but could do better. The same, though, can't be said about BMW's Mini Cooper S with its fantastic retro looks, both on the inside and the outside, and a heritage to match, meaning it's sure to sell and sell and sell. But like the MG, it lacks serious grunt. I'm sorry, but that whining supercharger is not for me. Renault's Clio Cup 172, on the other hand, seems like the perfect mix. It's very light, it looks mean, and it's the cheapest car here, a bargain at just under 13 grand. But cutting costs and weight by throwing out such modern-day essentials as ABS and aircon hardly seems like progress to me. Which is why Honda's Civic Type R has ruled the roost for the past year or so. It's still quicker to six than the Clio, despite the Renault's crash diet. It's a full-on racer with a lightning gear change and all the joys of Honda's fabled VTEC power plant allied to edgy, adrenaline-pumping handling. This is what the new boys on the block have got to beat. So let's remind ourselves just how good it is. So just wait till the rev counter goes past 6,000 and then let it sing all the way to its 8,200 RPM limit. This is what I call mechanical music, none of those twittering turbos or whining superchargers. This is a real engine. And the driving position is also so good, I sit low in a very supportive seat. I've got the steering and the pedals right where I want them. I've also got this sexy little gear lever right beside me. And the handling, the car feels so light, I can turn. Just a little bit of oversteer is easily caught. It feels much lighter and nimbler than any of the opposition that I've driven so far. One word of warning, though, in the wet, that uh, mild oversteer can become a bit of a snap. Another criticism is also the traction is not that good in the wet, but it's dry today. The Civic sets a target lap time of 54.9 seconds around the challenging Anglesey circuit. So, to take on the Honda, Seat have squeezed 210 horsepower under the Leon Svelte Spanish uniform. Sounds good to me. And the first thing you notice is just how smooth the power delivery is of this turbocharged engine. No sudden boost at all, just constant pressure. There is a lot more understeer, a lot more roll. It's generally a much softer car than the Civic, which is why on the road it's actually a more pleasurable car to drive because it's got a better ride. Around this racetrack. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I 
I'm having a lot of fun, but I don't think I'm going very quickly. Impressive, but not really hot. A fact underlined by lap time 1.1 seconds slower than the Hondas. So what about Ford? Well, they knew how good the Civic was and how powerful the Seat was going to be. So they turned to their rally team for inspiration. And like their world rally car, it's full of parts from specialists like Quaif, Garrett, AP, Saks, Brembo and Sparco. All top shelf automotive pornography for the die hard enthusiasts. It's not such good news on the inside, though. In keeping with the tradition of previous fast Fords, the interior is very Essex. You've got blue dials, blue trim, blue seats, a part blue steering wheel and a green starter button. But I'm not here to spend my time worrying about fashion. I'm here to feel just how good this RS is on a racetrack. It doesn't start that well because I'm sitting a bit high in these snazzy seats. I don't exactly hold me as well as I'd like them to. But I'm immediately impressed by the power of this turbocharged engine. First gear for the hairpin and straight away tucks into that tight apex. Good traction. This racing differential that they've developed in this car hold of the tarmac and launches this focus forward. by just 0.3 of a second. But you have to pay the price away from the track. You see, on public roads, it's not quite so convincing. That race-bred limited slip differential that provides such sharpness and traction on the circuit becomes its own worst enemy. As the boost pressure chimes in and out, the steering weight constantly varies. And any little hollows or odd cambers will pull the nose of the car this way or the other without really giving much warning. It becomes a nervous drive on country roads. The ride is also very, very harsh and the damping quite severe. This is a car really only for hardcore enthusiasts. So before you rush down to your local Ford dealership to try to put your name down for one of the four and a half thousand RSs to be built, I suggest you consider its on-road manners, its garish interior, and the fact that you're only going to five as change out of £20,000. Oh, and yes, that there's a 240 horsepower Volkswagen Golf due any day now. Right now, though, there's no doubt the Focus RS is the hottest of the hot on the track. But the Seat is a much smoother and better mannered road car. And for me, the best compromise between the two, and still the overall king of the hot hatches, is the Honda Civic Type R. Launched in 1996 to the kind of excitement reserved for World Cups and Beckham babies, the Lotus Elise was an instant hit. Six years on, second-hand prices start at 11 and a half grand. For the price of a cheap hot hatch, you could buy one of the best handling cars in the universe. 
but should you? Motoring know-alls will tell you that Lotus stands for loads of trouble, usually serious, and they'll direct you swiftly to something weighing two tonnes and that's been made in Germany. So is the Elise just a pretty waste of cash or does it make good second-hand sense? The crucial question is, can a girl like me buy a car like this and not regret it? cars at any price are more fun to drive than the Elise. It's that classic recipe. A lightweight chassis, a small but potent free revving engine and a beautifully damped wheel at each corner. The result is pure joy. You know exactly what it's doing because it communicates with you through your hands, your feet and your bum. It really is every bit as good as they say it is. Now, for all I know, Brad Pitt snores in bed, and who knows what irritating habits Cameron Diaz has. And alas, it's the same for the Elise. It's hard to get in and out of. It's noisy on the motorway, and while I'm at it, the boot is tiny. And what can we say about that hood? It's like a mincer test made of Lego. And once the hood is up, it's even harder to get in and out of. Oh, joy. As with any used car, service history, low mileage and condition are crucial. Early cars had a clutch pipe problem that meant you couldn't get reverse once the car had warmed up. Also, they had dodgy inlet manifolds, which caused blown head gaskets, but most of those problems will have been sorted by now. All get stone chips and broken driving lights. Window winders get sticky if they're not regularly lubricated, and that fabulous hood will let water in, particularly if your Elise lives outside. Many owners invest in a cover, but personally, I'd get a garage. Gators on ball joints and steering arms will split in time, leading to damage to more expensive parts. Again, maintenance is the key. The biggest worry is accident damage. Even when you get underneath, it's hard to see much of that fancy aluminium chassis, making it easy to hide a moody repair. Modifying cars is very much part of the Elise world. Trick exhaust systems, engine mods and detachable steering wheels abound. They're worth having if you like them, but they don't necessarily add value. For £11,500, expect anything up to 60,000 miles on the clock. A lot for an Elise. The more powerful 111S commands a £1,000 price premium and decent Mark II start at about £21,000. What else could you buy for the money? Well, for the price range of a second-hand Elise, you could have any modern sports car used, of course. From the cheap and cheerful Mazda MX-5 through to the excellent Honda S2000. All of them have more creature comforts, but they are that little bit softer. Specialist cars like the Elise often reach a point where depreciation meets demand and the price levels out. So if you buy a good low mileage car for 12 to 13 grand, it's unlikely to lose much value. Finally, be suspicious of anything that looks too cheap to be true. It probably is. So should you or I buy one? Well, yes but with one proviso. If you're going to use it as an everyday car, and lots of people do, then make sure you are not going to miss those creature comforts. You may experience the odd niggle or leak, but it is a small price to pay for one of the best driving experiences in the world. <laughs> Once the preserve of the aristocratic classes and the seriously rich, more and more of us these days are buying personal plates. They're the ultimate in automotive jewellery that'll hide the age of your car as well. And if you want to play the plate game, there are plenty of people prepared to separate you from your hard-earned. Look through any of the Sunday papers and you will see scores of dealers selling literally thousands of number plates. Plus, there are plenty of dedicated number plate websites too. But in the plate business, things often aren't what they seem. It's a world of illusion. Learn about the tricks of the trade before you buy and you could save lots of cash. And the best trick is to buy directly from the DVLA. They sell new, unissued number plates at auction, which means you will be buying 
at rock bottom money. The DVLA is, of course, open, honest and transparent, which means there is no risk. There are classic auctions where you find the more exclusive numbers and custom ones like this where things start at around 250 quid. If you haven't got your heart set on a particular combination of letters and numbers, there are lots of entertaining plates to snap up. Now, the point I'm making is that there is always, always something being sold cheaply at these auctions. Now, just look at this. A, B, E, 5, T. If your name is Andrew Best, it would be yours for 2,100. Um, here's a nice cover-up plate. Covers up the age of your car, you just plonk it on, nobody can tell how old it is. 180X, 700 pounds. That is not dear. And look at this. If your name is Andrew Gray, AGR4Y, 2200. I'm not countenancing that you muck about with the spacing, but all these plates here are being sold at less than market value. You could go again, you could sell them on later and make a profit. So come to these sales, be here in person just to mop up the cheap gear. 500 pounds, 500 in the hall. In fact, prices are so reasonable that dealers come here, buy from the DVLA and then sell them on with a massive markup. Look at this, nice one if you've got a Beamer. Sold for just 650 pounds, a dealer is selling it for just under two grand. What about this one? Nice plate, sold for 2,700 by the DVLA. The trade currently has it up for a fiver short of 10 grand. Unbelievable. But this, this is the best one. Corking plate, 911L. Sold for six grand. A dealer is advertising it for sale for over 15,000 pounds. That is a nine grand markup. Anyone can come and bid at these auctions, so aren't the dealer's markups thoroughly unreasonable? Well, I don't think they are. I mean, it's, um, we take a high risk when buying plates. Uh, we do our, all, all our own marketing, all our own advertising, and we make losses. We don't always make gains. Sold at £650. Buy a number, Janine. Dealers also say that they offer a wider choice, with access to numbers already in circulation and not just unissued plates, and that they're open longer hours. What they probably won't tell you is that they're advertising plates for sale that they don't even own. Look at this, M33JED, here on a dealer's website for £450, plus the transfer fee and VAT, taking it over £600. But here's the exact same number on the DVLA site for £250, including all extras. So always check with the DVLA to see that they haven't got it cheaper. And let's not forget, numbers are a really good investment. There will be lots of people in this room disaffected with their ices and tesses who are putting their money into plates. Why? Because over the last two years, number plates have increased in value 22%. Try getting that sort of interest rate from a building society. So what makes a plate an investment? Well, the shorter the better. And remember, one number and three letters are the ones to go for if you can afford them. Always try to get an S or A in the combination rather than, say, an F or Y, because they're the more common initials. And also don't rule out the new registrations. There are still combinations to be had there. Look at this. A Manchester registration could be MU51CAL. Positively lyrical. Earlier on, I said that there were always, always bargains at these sales. What about today? Unquestionably. I've just bought two. One, 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 A, X, G. That cost me 800 pounds. It doesn't spell a name or a word, but it's a brilliant cover-up plate. It will disguise the year of your car forever. 800 quid. 900 AXJ, again, great cover-up plate, looked fantastic on a Bentley. That one was £750. And I can go away securing the knowledge that if I bought either of these from a dealer, I would have paid three times as much. And it was all as easy as shopping at Woolworths. <laughs> Well, blow me down. There's a new version of the Renault Espace, that spawner of imitators and creator of one of the most influential niches in car history, that of the full-fat, full-size MPV. For 18 years, it's been close to the heart of many a suburban mum who forgot to stop having kids after the requisite duo. It catered for people who needed to seat seven in relative comfort, but without resorting to a family sunshine bus. In line with Renault's decision to get all fruity and bonkers on the design front, 
This new Mark IV has got some attitude. It's still just about recognisable as an Espas, but with some serious massaging to make sure Renault's brave new outlook isn't compromised by a dried-up old Weezer as the top family mover. And it looks, um, big. It might not be quite as brave as the Velsatis or the new Megane, let alone the visual headbutt that is the Aventine, but it couldn't be dismissed as weak design. It's sprog-moving chic as opposed to utility dowdy. And once you get inside, it's very light and bright and airy, and it's got loads of glass, mainly thanks to this huge sunroof. And the Espasa's interior is filled with these spacey liquid design cues. And with its blue digital dash, it looks like the kind of thing people thought cars would look like back in the 1960s. And as for in the back, Instead of the not-quite-three-seater crappy bench you get in most people carriers, you get all individual seats, and they're all interchangeable. You also get three-point harnesses on every single one, the usual picnic tables and stuff, and even air conditioning controls for the rat bags in the back. And if you thought your car had a lot of storage space, check this out. This thing's got more boxes and places to put stuff than anything I've ever seen. I mean, look at all this. Jesus, you could lose one of the kids. And like all new Renaults these days, keys just aren't cool anymore. It's all about cards and starter buttons and Mobius loops and tame black holes. Which is in keeping with the whole modern Espace thang. It's no longer about hoofing a small lorry about the place, more about a tall limo experience. In the real world, the best version to have is Renault's own 3-litre V6 diesel, mated to an automatic gearbox. You've got lots of lovely torque and you don't even have to change gear. At 30 mpg, the fuel economy isn't quite as good as the smaller diesel units, but it is much quieter thanks to something called multi-cylinder harmonics, which must be clever, because it's a diesel and my ears aren't bleeding. Even the driving makes the Espasa cut above the rest on its Laguna-based platform. No, it won't be scything down a nasty left-hander at 90 miles an hour, but you don't want the baby spewing down the back of your neck either, so the compromises it makes are good ones. And the thing is, the old Espasa used to feel a bit clumsy around town. I've been driving this for the past eight hours in Rome and in the countryside, and it's been absolutely fine. It's nimble, it behaves more like a car than the old one. In fact, it's a lot better than I thought it would be. I'm quite impressed. <laughs> All of which confirms that this isn't some sort of refurb delivery van, it's a genuine MPV. So whether all six of your passengers are on the way to a board meeting or a semi-naked beach party, they won't have much room for complaint. So the newest Espace is the Range Rover of people carriers. And for all the stuff you get, it's not actually that bad money starting at about 20 grand. Thing is, if you've got to have one of the breed, then original is still definitely the best. And it just goes to show that space doesn't have to be square.